and he uh, works extensively on El Salvadorian civil liberties and human rights issues. Good morning, Tim. It's good to see you. Good morning. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Next up, we have uh, Gabriel Labrador, and Gabriel Labrador is an investigative journalist with El Faro, which is El Salvador's award-winning digital newspaper. Good morning, Gabriel. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for the invitation, Sandy, and pleasure to be with you. Then we have Tiziano Breda, who is an analyst for Central America with the International Crisis Group, which is an independent nonprofit, non-governmental organization committed to preventing and resolving deadly conflict. Good morning, Tiziano. Good morning, Sending. Thanks for the invitation. It's an honor to join you today. And uh, last and certainly not least is Mary Jo McConaughey, who is today's moderator. And she is a prize winning author, journalist, and documentary filmmaker who covered the war in El Salvador and reports on Latin America for US publications. And maybe most importantly, today is Mary Jo's birthday. So welcome, Mary Jo. Thank you so much for moderating this. And uh, let me turn everything over to you right now. Thank you. And as I, I told Sandy and the others before, there's no place I'd, I'd rather be. Um, thank you for this wonderful panel that you put together, Sandy. And uh, congratulations to all of you in the audience for your interest in this um, uh, wonderful and important country, uh, El Salvador. The Civil War I covered as a reporter in El Salvador ended in 1992, having taken the lives of 75,000 persons, most of them civilians, dead at the hands of a US-backed military. Since then, Salvadorans have elected governments from the left and the right, culminating now in the presidency of 39-year-old Naib Bukele, who has mocked the memory of the war, appears to be ignoring the rule of law, and has a New York Times headline this week asking, Will Naib Bukele be Latin America's next strongman? Early this month, he oversaw the firing of justices of the Supreme Court and the Attorney General. Was this a kind of coup to guarantee Bukele and his allies impunity for whatever comes next? Tim, can you tell us how El Salvador got to Bukele for beginners? What kind of president he is and what he's doing and what it means? Well, how much time do you have, Mary Jo? Uh, let me try to condense that uh, very quickly uh, and explain about uh, Najib Bukele and, and what he means in El Salvador. Um, so who is this guy, uh, Najib Bukele? Um, he was elected president of El Salvador in uh, 2019 at the age of 37, making him the youngest head of state in the, uh, in the Americas. And the one thing you need to know about Najib Bokele starting out is that he is also by far the most popular politician in El Salvador for the past five years. His approval ratings, his popularity ratings exceed 80%. When people are polled about his handling of the pandemic, he gets like a 95% approval rating. So uh, we're talking about a very popular president uh, in uh, El Salvador. Um, and he won easily in 2019 in a three-way race. And the other two candidates were from ARENA, uh, the conservative right-wing party that had uh, governed during the Civil War and then after, uh, and then a candidate from the FMLN, the party of the former uh, leftist uh, guerrillas. And Bukele won in the first round, getting more than 50% of the, of the vote. And why did he win so easily? Um, well, part of it is his strong pop popularity grown from his time as mayor of, San of El Salvador and a cult of, frankly, a cult of personality uh, that surrounds him. But that popularity combined with Salvadoran voters' rejections of rejection of those two old parties which had governed El Salvador for the prior 30 years 
you know, three of the four presidents before Bukele um, have been charged with stealing hundreds of millions of, of dollars from the, from the country. There are uh, videos of politicians from those two parties negotiating with El Salvador street gangs for votes in uh, elections. The people did not see improvements in their lives during the, during the years following the, the Civil War. And so they were ready for a change and to throw out the, the old guard. And that was his campaign message when he was elected, was throw out the corrupt ones. And he was constantly saying, there's enough money when no one steals. Uh, and if you elect me president, a bit. It was essentially saying, I'm going to guide El Salvador towards being a modern leading country in the region. And in doing that campaign message, he is the master politician of social media. No politician in El Salvador still does social media the way he does to brand himself, to convey his message, but also to weaponize social media against his, uh, against his critics, against his political opponents. So immediately after he took office, he began to clash with the legislative assembly. Uh, the assembly had all been elected the year before when he didn't have a political party. And frankly, he had encouraged people not to vote in that election. And so the legislative assembly when Bukele came into office was uh, filled with his political opponents. He probably only had 10 to 15 allies in the 84 member assembly. And probably the first point where the international community started to notice uh, Bukele's um, autocratic tendencies was in February of 2009. Uh, at that point, Bukele wanted a $109 million international loan approved, essentially mostly to buy uh, equipment and materials for the security forces in the country. And the assembly ha had not acted. And so Bukele called his uh, supporters together, told the assembly it needed to come into session. Uh, and he showed up uh, at the assembly, marched into the assembly with armed troops. Uh, and we saw images uh, like uh, like this in the in the assembly that day. So we have Bukele standing outside talking to his supporters surrounded by troops. And then he marches in with the armed troops into the legislative assembly. He seats himself in the chair of the president of the legislative assembly. Um, bows his head and prays silently for 10 minutes, then goes back out to his supporters outside the Legislative Assembly and says he's received a message from God. God has told him to have patience and to give the Assembly another week to act on his loan, uh, on his loan proposal. Uh, and uh, those images that really called to mind the military coups that afflicted Latin America throughout the 20th century really produced international condemnation. And the Constitutional Chamber of El Salvador's Supreme Court ruled against him and said that he had no constitutional power to demand that the Legislative Assembly came in into session. And then the pandemic happens. Um, just uh, a, a month after he had marched into the assembly, uh, Bukele gets essentially the powers granted by a pandemic. He begins to rule by emergency decree, doing things like a very strong lockdown of the entire country that included people being picked up off of the streets for violating uh, uh, the, the lockdown and put in quarantine centers for up to um, 30 days, regardless of whether or not they um, uh, were infected with the, with the virus. One example of what Bukele was doing, one at one point he's angered by photos of residents of a seaside town in El Salvador um, who were out on, the, out, out on the street seeming to go back to daily life. 
Bukele declared a 24 hour a day curfew and sent military troops uh, into the streets of, of that town, the town of La Libertad, uh, to, uh, to, to enforce that curfew. Uh, the Legislative Assembly starts pushing back against him uh, last, last summer. The Constitutional Chamber uh, agrees with the Legislative Assembly on issues orders limiting uh, Bukele's power, which he defies uh, and, uh, and ignores. Um, and the investigative press, um, publications like El Faro, where Gabriel works and others, start to raise questions about corruption in the contracting for things like PPE supplies and other uh, materials needed for dealing with the, uh, with the pandemic. And the attorney general who, had been, who was appointed by that same legislative assembly raids the Ministry of Health in November. So February 28th of this year, um, a new legislative assembly gets elected. Uh, and this is the first time when Najib Bukele's a party, political party, Nuevas Ideas, New Ideas, is running for, for office. And none of what had happened in the prior year, none of Bukele's actions dealing with the pandemic, not his invasion of the legislative assembly with the military, had done anything to dent his, his popularity. Uh, and his party, Nuevas Ideas, sweeps the elections on February 28th, gets uh, with its allies, a controlling majority, not just more than 50%, but more than two thirds of the assembly, which is enough to, uh, uh, to uh, elect the attorney general, enough to elect uh, the constitutional chamber, enough to approve loans. Actually, it's all the power in the legislative assembly. And that new legislative assembly took office on May, May 1st, so less than two weeks ago. And on May 1st, the very first day of this new legislative assembly, uh, two of the former officials in Bukele's government, who are now elected as deputies in the assembly, become the president and the vice president of the assembly. They announce that the rules of the assembly are being suspended and that the first matter that's going to be taken up is the removal of all five magistrates of the constitutional chamber and their alternates. And the Nuevas Ideas uh, deputies in the chamber break into wild applause. Debate is limited to a total of one hour. And at the end of the hour, they vote. And uh, with a vote of 64 to 19, they vote to impeach essentially and throw out all those five magistrates. During the one hour of debate, they say that the reason they're being thrown out is because they had been blocking the measures that Bukele wanted to take during the, during the pandemic. Standing in the wings of the assembly are five new magistrates for the constitutional chamber handpicked. And uh, 30 minutes later, those five new magistrates are elected and there are people there to escort them there to the uh, chambers of the Supreme Court to take office. Next, they announced that they are going to take up the firing of the attorney general, the chief prosecutor, the person who had been investigating corruption in uh, pandemic contracting. The same thing happens. Uh, he is impeached with a 64 to 19 vote and his handpicked successor is elected immediately after that. And so just like that, on the very first night that Bukele's party is in control of the legislative assembly, the constitutional chamber is gone, the attorney general is gone. Um, it, four of the five magistrates of the assembly and the attorney general all turn in letters of resignation the next day. It is widely assumed that they were coerced into writing these eerily similar letters of res resignation. The international condemnation that, um, by the United States, the Organization of American States, the United Nations, the European Unions, universities in El Salvador, human rights groups, all condemn uh, the actions on May 1st. 
but there is very little evidence that this is affecting the opinion of the men and women on the street who voted for uh, Bukele. The one last thing I, I wanna just quickly say is Bukele's approach to the military. Um, he has been courting the military from the first day he came into office. The military has received its biggest budget increase since the end of the Civil War of almost 50, of almost 50 percent uh, increase. The military called a press release uh, conference the day before Bukele invaded the assembly on February 9th last year to declare their loyalty to Bukele. Um, and, you know, that's just one of the things, you know, worrisome about, uh, about Bukele and the question of, you know, what's going to happen next, uh, which I think is something we'll be talking about more during the rest of uh, our time together this morning. Wow. Wow. That's, that's fabulous, Tim. Uh, I'm sure if people have questions, uh, you can put your uh, there should be a Q and A at the bottom of your screen. So let's uh, let's have questions, which we'll address at the end. Uh, you know, it, during the war, Salvadorans fled the country by hundreds of thousands. Uh, it, it was a migration that tore apart families and the social fabric of towns and villages. I remember a nightly uh, radio program broadcast in Salvador and Los Angeles with mothers calling into the Salvador station, pleading for news from their sons. Like, you know, Enrique from Sacamil, call home if you can hear this. Uh, it was a heartrending time. Uh, Tiziano, is there a link between that outmigration during the war and Salvadorans uh, attempting to cross uh, in the U.S. border today. Uh, can you let us know how the numbers and situations of the Salvadorans compare to those coming from other countries? And uh, what might Bukele do to provide uh, options for those who want to stay home? Thank you very much, Mary Jo. Um, and indeed, there are several links um, that uh, combine the situation nowadays to, to that of the, of, the, of the war, particularly in regarding to migration. And I would identify at least two of them. First of all, of course, as you said, hundreds of thousands of people fled the country during the time of the civil war. Um, more though, after that, of course, also due to the earthquakes, natural disasters that hit the country, etc. So they, they settled in the US, particularly in California, but then spread out throughout the country, um, very strong communal and family uh, networks that um, function uh, nowadays that influence basically also the, the, the in, uh, inflow of migrants uh, to the US in two ways. They either facilitate, help financially or logistically the people who still want to leave the country for several reasons, ranging from the economic to the security, and I'll get to it. Um, uh, or they simply, you know, uh, uh, attract new possible newcomers for being basically family members in the in the country, and or oftentimes father who left behind the uh, their wives and children, etc. So there's a, also family reunification uh, pull factor, if you want to call it that way. So the the first link is the presence of these strong links, these networks um, in the US that uh, interact with the, with the possible migrants that are nowadays still seek to, to, to reach the US, um, which has become basically a cultural uh, reference of in a country uh, torn by violence, uh, with, uh, you know, widespread uh, um, poverty, etc. Um, reaching the US basically has become for many the only way to try and, and, and build a better life. Um, the second link, possibly less evident, but uh, deeper and, and darker in a way, is the, the one that relates to the one of the main push factor from Salvador for migrants, which is the issue of violence, which uh, despite the end of the civil war and the, the signing of the peace agreements, uh, never, never really uh, went down in the country, just turns basically um, uh, shaped into a different uh, sort of uh, violence and perpetrated by different actors, etc. But um, mostly, uh, the, the role of gangs basically in this is very important to underline. And 
I relate this because, of course, these communities that settled in the, um, in the 80s, 70s and 80s in, in California, particularly, um, were surrounded by an hostile, in an hostile environment, surrounded by other uh, already constituted uh, uh, Black, Latino, and Asian gangs, um, constantly harassed, marginalized, and stigmatized in, in, in the US. And basically, the, the birth of, of gangs such as the MS-13 and the Barrio 18 or 18th Street Gang, which actually though that it's a little bit uh, further back, um, bas were basically a reaction, uh, a measure of protection that these migrants uh, uh, basically uh, introduced to, to defend themselves from these other gangs. And their expansion or their um, taking roots in El Salvador and in the other Central American countries of Guatemala and Honduras uh, is related to the U.S. migration policies that uh, at the end of the 80s, but particularly in the 90s, started to deport thousands of gang members uh, to these countries uh, who offered the perfect fertile ground for gangs to expand, uh, disrupted social fabric, uh, a post-war transition, um, widespread poverty, uh, and a culture of violence, basically, that never experienced peace, etc. So, in El Salvador, in that regard, is a bit unique because, first of all, I mean, the, the Mara Salvadorcha was actually originated by Salvadoran uh, migrants in the US. So, it has also a nationality uh, uh, element that possibly explains why in El Salvador it's estimated that the MS 13 doubles the membership of the two factions that currently exist of the 18th Street Gang uh, in, in the country, whereas in Guatemala and Honduras, the proportion is more even, or actually in, in Guatemala, it's definitely uh, the membership is stronger by the, and the presence is stronger by the MSA, sorry, the 18th Street Gang. Um, and secondly, um, the, the second unique element of El Salvador is the territorial presence of gangs, which is estimated to uh, uh, have a hold on um, a, around 90% of the country's municipalities. Uh, which is definitely something that is not uh, happening. It's not happening in Guatemala and Honduras. So the violence exercised by gangs um, in the form of threats, uh, of forced recruitment, of extortion, of gender-based violence, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is one of the main actually drivers of outbound migration. Um, and actually, Salvadorans in, in surveys, in recent year surveys where among the Central Americans who most cited violence uh, and insecurity uh, as the main reason to flee uh, the country. I remember a, a, a survey by the Inter-American Development Bank in late 2019, where so almost half of Salvador, 48%, if I'm not mistaken, uh, surveyed, um, identified insecurity as the main reason to flee the country, whereas Guatemala, for example, uh, of course, uh, it was well beyond, I think it was between 20 and 30%. So it's, it was uh, definitely stronger the economic uh, element in, in trying to build a better life than, than the violence exercised in the country as a main reason to flee. Um, and of course, what, what, what is Bukele's, uh, what, what has changed since Bukele's arrival and how can this affect the migration flows? Uh, it, it's still to be seen. Of course, we, we're experiencing um, a great, uh, a, a, an incredible, basically, uh, downward trend in homicides, um, which have reached the historical lows uh, and basically have flattened now to around three to four uh, daily murders in a country that just six years ago uh, experienced an average of 25 murders per day. Um, but, and, and, and that's also, and but, that on one side, and, and secondly, uh, Bukele's communicational effectiveness, as Tim was uh, referring to, um, the uh, the perception of security has, has also improved. Uh, if you look at um, the yeah, latest UDOP surveys in 2020, um, uh, also, of course, affected by the pandemic, but insecurity was uh, the uh, main concern of around 15% of interviews. If you look at 2018 statistics of surveys by the same institute, uh, around 60% of interviews identify insecurity, gangs violence, um, and, and delinquency as the main concern in the country. Um, but does, does that mean that 
the gang issue has been sorted out and then, you know, that, that uh, people won't flee uh, gangs because they've disappeared, not at all. Um, we in crisis group um, almost one year ago suggested that this sort of decrease in homicide um, was more due to uh, gangs' uh, decision basically to scale back the use of violence as part of an informal understanding with the government. Um, and a couple of months later, uh, Gabriel Alfaro's colleagues uh, actually uh, added evidence to this, to this hypothesis, uh, proving that there were actually conversations between government officials and uh, gang members in jails, uh, particularly from the MS-13. Um, which, uh, although it's, it's been denied by the government and kept under secrecy, means that if it is so, we're witnessing a very fragile equilibrium that can be uh, reversed and can break apart at some moment, rekindling the levels of, of violence in the country. Secondly, the underlying conditions that breed gangs membership, um, such as marginalization, lack of economic opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, um, have not changed dramatically since Bukele took office. Actually, possibly during the pandemic, they've gotten worse. Um, and thirdly, the gang's presence actually in the communities and their um, sort of criminal governance or territorial control, as you want to call it, uh, has anything but decreased so far. So Bukele has tried to um, promote the idea that, is, that, the, that the state is regaining control of the territory, which is, we don't have evidence of, um, and has been trying to intervene in poor and gang control communities through the uh, a newly established unit called the, the Unit for the Reconstruction of the Social Public, which uh, or whose intervention uh, um, aimed at, you know, bringing uh, opportunities, training, and communal spaces for, for, for youngsters is definitely uh, loadable, and uh, we believe that it's a, a positive step in the medium to long run uh, to offer alternatives to, to youngsters uh, at risk of being recruited. But of course, um, it's, still, it's still early to see the results of these initiatives. Um, and actually, just to wrap up, we uh, think, I mean, we're seeing with concern what is happening in, in Southern terms of polarization political harassment, et cetera, to journalists, I mean, Gabriel will, will tell us about it then. Um, but because that could add to the historic, you know, drivers of outbound migration, of course, related to family reunification, economic opportunity, lack of economic opportunities, uh, violence, there could be a fourth element, uh, which is politically motivated, uh, prosecution, harassment, um, and, and threats, um, which, uh, have you know, being uh, at least uh, in, in these uh, three decades of post-war period have basically were, were, were uh, absent uh, so far. But we, we can see the risk that they could uh, increase in the future. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to the, to the wow. discussion. Thanks. That's, just, that's, that's great, Tizia. I mean, it really explains uh, the motive for many people leaving that the government is actually fighting the gangs for territory. Uh, so that there is violence, even though the murder rate has gone down, and 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 people are fleeing for their own security and that of their families. Thank you for that. That's that was great, uh, it, Gabriel. You're on the ground in El Salvador, and it's it's great to have you here to tell us about the state of something absolutely fundamental to any democracy, uh, whether it's under Bukele or anywhere uh, else, but especially under Bukele now, uh, that is the free press and public access to information. Are journalists free to do their work? Uh, are there roadblocks to legitimate investigations? And what risks do reporters like you run uh, and and uh, I, one thing I'd really like to know, having heard from Tim about the huge popularity of uh, Bukele and uh, from Tiziano about nevertheless the lack of security, uh, tell us where this popularity of uh, Bukele comes from. So that's a lot, but I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing yeah. you. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank the Santa Fe Council for 
bringing this topic um, to a live stream because I'm, I'm pretty sure many things are going to happen in the coming days. So you all better be connected with what's going on here. Um, well, I'll try to begin with what you asked uh, just now about um, why Bukele is so popular. Um, I think, well, Tim did mention many, many, many things, but I think the most important explanation for Bukele's uh, popularity is that uh, uh, Bukele connects with people, with what people think, with what people need. I'm sorry, this uh, um, has a sound uh, next to my door, but I, I hope you can hear me well. Um, but I think Bukele knows, knows what the people suffer, what, what is the people thinking in an exact moment of time. So he has this uh, huge apparatus of um, stalking in social media. Um, and he knows exactly when to say something. Absolutely, I mean, every single message he delivers either on Twitter or in a, on TV or in Facebook, everything it's, um, it's, it's like driven by, by this absolutely knowledge of what to say in the exact moment. Um, so he's, he's a mastermind in, in publicity and advertising. So, so um, that explains a lot. And well, and as for the state of press in the Republic, well, well, I guess I can still <laughs> call it that way, Republic of El Salvador. Um, let me begin just uh, talking about the big picture of what's going on here. The Salvadorian Press Association has registered uh, so far in 2021, there, there have been like 113 press freedom violations. This means that um, the number of of offenses against uh, members of the press has doubled compared to the violations occurred in the same period in 2020. Nayib Bukele, we must remember, took office in June 2019. So 60% of these press freedom violations are mostly restrictions to journalists. That is blocking journalists to make questions in the ground, questions to state officers or members of the National Assembly or whatsoever. As a matter of fact, just hours later, the, the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court was beheaded, as well as the Attorney General Office. Many journalists of various media outlets, outlets were denied access to the Attorney General's office. Um, armed guards blocked their entrance and said that they only obeyed orders from superiors. But at the time, at the same time, they let journalists from the state television and official and official newspaper to enter the office. So there's like a ban for some journalists, and there's a to complete access to to the one the journalists that favor Bukele. Um, there are 18 episodes of press freedom violations that have to do with digital harassment and physical assaults. I will mention just a couple of them. On May 1st, for example, the day the new assembly took office, journalist Karen Moreno of Gato Encerrado magazine was harassed by members of an union that has shown total obedience to President Bukele and the ruling party in Nuevas Ideas. That same day, Moreno also was a victim of cyber, cyber bullying promoted by elect Bukele supporters. Another episode of harassment occurred during the election day on February 28th reporter of Facto Magazine, Brian Avelar, received death threats by Nuevas Ideas party supporters who told Avelar he should leave the area as quick as possible if he didn't want to be beaten with his own motorcycle helmet. Bukele hasn't condemned any of these attacks. On the contrary, he seems to be supportive of the idea that journalists should receive a scoop of their own medicine. He tweeted on March 25th, Freedom of expression is a fundamental right that will be 100% guaranteed in our country. But that right also includes us, so we can freely laugh at the ridiculous ridiculousness these pamphlets publish. 
Bukele's administration has shown unprecedented uh, hostility towards press, but this is not a surprise. In 2016, he showed he was willing to swipe democratic institutions if they stepped in the middle of his career of gaining pro in, in gaining pro in gaining power. Sorry. Um, just to mention something, uh, he rallied against the attorney general in, in 2016. I mean, he went with a bunch of, of supporters and stepped outside the building of the general attorney and started screaming and, and doing things because he wasn't, um, he didn't like the, the attorney investigating him with some case. Uh, so things started to happen in, I think, started to, to change in 2017 when he was mayor of the capital city. Uh, he began to block journalists that were covering his, his political actions. Uh, he justified some blockings, for, for example, um, by saying that these newspapers were publishing lies about him. So the solution he just made out was uh, to, to block him to, to cover. Uh, things that the city hall was doing. Um, before that, Bukele, of course, showed him, himself as a democratic leader. He always uh, was available for, for uh, questions and, and everything, but then he started to change. Uh, when Bukele took office uh, in 2019, uh, well, he should not, we, we as El Faro noticed that uh, we wouldn't have the chance to ask questions in press conferences. The president would take uh, between three or five questions each, each time, and there was no chance that El Faro or other independent media could get the opportunity to make those questions. Uh, to limit the number of questions has been a practice for many presidencies, not only Bukele, but certainly Bukele has become the first president to ban specific journalists to make questions. Um, I'm running out of time, but I'm, I'm on a press conference I, I'm, I'm, I held at the presidential palace on September 24, 2020. Colleagues from Revista Factum and myself were banning to enter to the conference. That day, I tried to reach the conference room, but a soldier, a soldier blocked my way as it happened with other two colleagues. Press secretary said that in previous conferences, journalists of El Paro had bad behavior by interrupting the, the conference and bursting, bursting in with questions without permissions once, once the conference was over. So we are not allowed to make questions. And so we have to shout in and that's bad behavior according to the press secretary. Um, well, uh, Something very important is that the presidency and his allies have access to an entire army of blogs, media outlets, Twitter and Facebook fake accounts. Also, the president has access to state controlled media. This is the public television and the public radio station. Um, they, using those media outlets, um, they use them to attack news media. These are outlets outlets that belong to elect criminals and were sized, sized by Salvadoran government. Now these platforms are operated by the National Property Management Council. And those were used to attack El Faro and make um, tremendous allegations with no, with no basis at all. Um, I, I don't know, I probably have to stop here because, but I'm, I don't know what, I can, I, can, I can go on if you want, if you like. It's amazing. I'm sure we could go an hour just with you, Gabriel. <laughs> and, um, and maybe uh, people would have some specific questions. Uh, tremendous work, you and your colleagues uh, at, uh, at El Faro and others. Uh, yeah, and that just are, are, maybe just I, I want to wrap up with something very quickly. Um, El Faro is, is right now under close scrutiny by government. And I mean, this per se is not something bad. I mean, um, but the problem is that there's, uh, I mean, there's a 
fabrication, fabrication of cases against us. The Ministry of Finances, for example, has fabricated a case of tax evasions against the FARO. It is an absurd conclusion. Um, the government has documents and proofs that the FARO has paid all his due taxes every, every time. And there was an allegation of, of uh, uh, sexual assault of one of our colleagues, but it was completely false as well. So um, we'll have to, to put up with that and many other struggles are, are still to come. Well, you can, you can count on people watching from the outside. And uh, uh, it, I, as, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous work that you're doing. Uh, look, I, I know that our time is limited and we wanna to get to questions. And uh, I'm sure people have questions for each of these uh, great uh, uh, panelists, but there is one thing that I, I feel we need to bring up and that is the uh, judicial process that's going on right now uh, against members of the military in El Salvador for perpetrating the El Mosote massacre of a thousand people, half of them children uh, in 1981. Uh, two weeks ago, expert witnesses testified exhaustively to details, including the presence of a U.S. advisor there at the time. What is the practical importance and even the symbolic importance of this trial, despite the passage of time? And what does it mean that it's taking place in El Salvador and not abroad, as we have had cases tried like that of the torture survivor Neris Gonzalez here in the United States. Uh, but what is the importance of trying this war crime there in El Salvador? And how is the military, because uh, their members are virtually in the dock, their brothers are in the dock, they're the accused. How are they reacting at this point? Anybody? Well, yeah, um, I just want to point out something about that um, I think th those cases are, I mean, very important that are like um, just taken to trial here in El Salvador. But uh, I think Bukele is not interested um, in anything of that. I mean, it's not that he has the power to decide, but um, he definitely has like a grip or like a power to incite or to influence the opinion, the, the public opinion and, and to explain the importance to just um, like investigate this, these crimes here in El Salvador, but he won't do that. Why? Because for example, in the Jesuit case, uh, the, the Jesuit killings occurred in 1989 um, Bukele could do many things to uh, investigate um, or to promote the investigation of the case in El Salvador, but he hasn't said a word. When he speaks about the case, uh, he only uses, uses it like, um, like a tool to attack opponents. For example, uh, there was an, a former deputy or member of the National Assembly, Rodolfo Parque, who is allegedly the lawyer who altered or modified the testimonies of many uh, members of the army uh, that when the inve investigations of the, of the crime occurred, right? But um, so Bukele, his only motivation to speak about the case is to attack Rodolfo Parque. And he's not interested in following the truth or like um, just going deep into the circumstances and, and find out what happened really. So I'm not sure the, the cases are going to succeed here in El Salvador because there's lack of interest, political interests. And could this uh, involvement with the, you know, getting rid of the Supreme Court justices and the attorney general, could that ultimately filter down and have some effect, maybe Tim? Uh, Sure. effect on the process of justice. Yeah. 
Sure, just to, I mean, when Bukele came into office uh, in the first couple of weeks, he at least nominally said he supported justice for the uh, victims of, of El Masote, but everything he's done since has been contrary to that. Uh, one of the, so the El Masote trial is the only trial for war crimes and abuses that has actually proceeded in El, El Salvador. Um, because there's this courageous judge in a small rural courtroom in northeastern El Salvador prose prosecuting the case and hearing from the, from the witnesses. Um, so one risk is that this judge who has been courageous throughout um, may be removed from the case. There is a motion uh, brought by, by the defense, and actually it was originally brought by the old attorney general's office uh, to remove the judge uh, from the case because the judge wrote about human rights abuses during the Civil War as a law student before he became a, a lawyer. Um, and now they're using that to try and uh, remove him. But the other thing Bukele has done has blocked access to this judge to the military archives. Um, he has said that um, as commander in chief, he is taking responsibility and he is uh, not going to permit the judge uh, to have access along with military records uh, experts uh, to that. And it can all, only be seen as part of Bukele's um, uh, trying to be very close and have a very close alliance with the military, which has rewarded him uh, with their uh, close allegiance in, in his time in office. Thank you. You know, we're going to have to move on to questions, uh, which I'm sure we're all enthusiastic to do. So let me hand it over to Sandy. I think there are some wonderful questions coming up. Thanks, Mary Jo. Absolutely. There's a lot of really good questions here. Um, I want to start with Gabriel. And Gabriel, I want to just point out for folks, we have a lot of people in our audience who are really concerned and interested in journalism. And I want you all to, uh, to know that El Faro uh, needs some donations to continue doing the amazing work it does. Uh, we'll put a, a link in the chat room to, uh, to please do so. Gabriel, can you, is it true that ultimately the fact that Bukele has reduced violence in the country is the real reason why people like him so much. Is the reduction in, in violence, you know, key to what he's doing? No, I don't think that's the, the, the key or the core of the explanation of why people like Bukele. I think uh, that's, that's an answer for a part of the society, like the middle class society or, or upper class, I don't know. But in the ground, the people that live in shacks or live in, in the communities where gang members live, they still live under their absolute dominance. So they suffer extortion, They're, they suffer like um, threats of like kidnapping a daughter just because that's the way they, they live. If they want something, they just get it. So people really are like suffering still the, the dominance of, 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 gang, of gangs. So um, the rates of homicides have just decreased, right? But there's a, there's a huge, a lot of the other problems in communities that explain why gangs are still powerful. And I think, uh, I think people just uh, like Bukele because like he's, he speaks something, he delivers messages, very clever messages. Uh, he addresses like things like uh, social, uh, why, why, why the poverty exists, why, why the, los mismos de siempre is the, the phrase like the usual suspects uh, are the, the the bad folks in the movie. So I think um, the explanations comes more like uh, if we see the kind of personality and the, the cult of image that Bukele, Bukele is, is like um, 
constantly promoting. Mm -hmm. Well, let me uh, throw a similar question over to you, Tiziano. Uh, and this is a question from Tommy Sue Montgomery. Uh, you know, you spoke about the decline in homicides as Gabriel did just now. Well, what about the almost equivalent increase in disappearances? Are we seeing a rise in you know, what has happened in other Latin American countries from Argentina and Chile from, from years ago as a tactic to uh, you know, control dissidents? Thank you very much, Sandy, and for those in the audience who all three of the questions. Um, there's uh, actually um, a decrease in disappearances as well. Uh, so it's not true that they are going up while open sites are going down. Uh, we, since Bukele took office, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a down in around 40% of disappearances complaints. Uh, last year, the Attorney General's office um, received some 2,500 disappearances complaints. Uh, in 2019, they were over 3,500. So we are looking at, at a widespread decrease of violent acts in terms of uh, homicides, basically, and, and disappearances of bodies. I would also like to point out that not all disappearances are automatically translated into homicides. Usually 50% of the cases are, uh, are resolved. And of those 50%, some 10% is usually, uh, you know, ended, ends up in finding dead bodies, but the other uh, 90 of that 50, so the 40% in total of cases usually is uh, people are encountered uh, alive. Of course, there's another 50% of cases of who are not sold and oftentimes hide more and more homicides. The problem is certainly uh, that the disappearance complaints for now two years, I think in a row, have outnumbered the number of homicides. Um, so it, there's, um, and actually just, uh, yesterday or today, the new attorney general has referred to the issue as a very great concern. And um, it's actually an, a matter that needs to be addressed uh, and more political will needs to be in, in very, in, uh, inverted into this because, um, invested into this, sorry, because it's, it's a really great problematic in the country. And sometimes uh, it's related to gangs, but also to security forces and to, to other practices. Um, and just to wrap up, I also saw that there was a, a question on, on missiles counting, um, and I just wanted to point it out that uh, uh, the El Salvador basically has one of the best um, systems of uh, gauging on missiles because not only is the police, which is usually attached to the executive, counting the on missiles, but at, uh, once a month it sits down with the Attorney General's office, which until two weeks ago was definitely not in line, not aligned with the Bukele government. And uh, the uh, Forensic uh, Institute of Medicine and compare figures and uh, agree on uh, three partisan final figures. So, what we uh, the, 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 the figures that we see uh, coming out of that, from that mesa, from that uh, sitting table, are definitely uh, reliable. Um, so, we're looking definitely at a, a concrete decrease in homicides and disappearances. Of course, as I was mentioning, and Gabriel was also referring to, that doesn't mean that violent other ways of expressing violence, the threats, extortion, um, the, the, the forced displacement, um, the sexual abuses, etc., uh, are also going down. On the contrary, actually, murders against women, uh, although we cannot make the exact link to gangs, but murders against women are going up on the, uh, and contra contrasting the uh, downward trend in homicides. Um, so it's it's a complicated matter, but in terms of figures, it, it is definitely one of the things that we can can confidently say. And I agree with Gabriel that it might be just one. I mean, I think it's part of the equation uh, that Bukele's effectiveness, although with the uh, uh, doubtful, uh, so doubtful means uh, of bringing down homicides of pitching the construction of new hospitals, of handing out humanitarian aid during the pandemic, um, which has definitely been more effective than its neighbors in Guatemala and Honduras. And now with the vaccines we've seen, El Salvador as the, one of the best performing countries in all Latin America, when Guatemala and, and Honduras are struggling to, to reach the first 1% of the population to be vaccinated. Um, so all of these issues, of course, promoted by uh, the, the machinery, the mechan 
communication machinery of Kelly and very great communication skills uh, nurture, fuel this, uh, this popularity of the president. But the, the security issue, I believe that it can be part of the equation for some at least. Thanks. Thank you. And I think we'll come back to more uh, some questions about gangs and, and negotiations with gangs in a minute. I wanted to pull the lens back just for a minute and Tim throw a question to you. I'm going to guess that when Bukele came into office, he was warmly welcomed by uh, President Trump, who had a, obviously a strong affinity for uh, authoritarian rulers. Can you give us an update on how El Salvador and United States relations have evolved over the last couple of years, given you know, President Biden's administration, given some of the migration issues and bilateral aid? Can you speak broadly to, uh, to those sets of points? Sure. Um, yeah, it was certainly true that uh, Bukele enjoyed a warm relationship with the Trump administration. Um, uh, when Bukele met with Trump on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly, he is famously quoted as saying uh, that uh, Trump was nice and cool. Um, and there were regularly trips to El Salvador from senior officials of the Trump administration, uh, from the attorney general to the head of the Department of Homeland Security, et cetera. So we had, um, and the Trump administration was all about, uh, you know, uh, migration as, as, as we know. And as long as uh, you said you were going to work on reducing mi migration, then Trump didn't care about things like good governance or uh, human rights abuses or other kinds of things in, in El Salvador. So there was this, uh, there was this uh, trade-off. Um, and so, uh, sorry for the uh, chimes in the, in the background. Um, but with the with the Biden administration, we see a, a, a an administration that uh, believes that if you have a government a government in Central America that is plagued by corruption or is plagued by uh, bad, bad governance, that that will ultimately produce more uh, more more my, more migration. Um, uh, the, Biden administration has come out strongly against the deposing of the Supreme Court and the and the Attorney General. It was a message delivered uh, earlier this week by Ricardo Zuniga, uh, Biden's special envoy to the North, Northern Northern Triangle. Um, he met with Bukele. He met with uh, uh, leaders of the opposition. He met with leaders of the Legislative Assembly to deliver that message. Uh, all of which uh, resulted in Bukele tweeting, because like uh, Trump, he governs by Twitter, um, Bukele tweeting, uh, essentially, nice to hear your point of view, uh, but it's not going to happen. We're not reversing anything we've done uh, so far. Uh, and for the Biden administration, there is a concern as well that China um, is making itself uh, much more a, uh, a welcome friend. China, in contrast, has been saying, hey, it's our policy not to interfere in the internal affairs of countries. Uh, and China has offered uh, to uh, fund a number of projects, including uh, at tourism projects along the coast, a, a state-of-the-art soccer stadium, a uh, water desalinization plant um, as uh, China attempts to increase its influence in that part, this part of the world. Fascinating. Um, yeah, there was a, a brief question in uh, the chat about trade relations with China. Um, and whether that has uh, more of an influence on, on within El Salvador. Can you speak just a little bit more to the China issue, uh, Tim? Um, you know, in terms of the trading relationship, uh, the relationship with the United States is much more important in terms of just the quantity of goods and services. And as a practical matter, the relationship with the United States is always going to be important because, I mean, the fundamental fact related to migration is that one out of every four people born in El Salvador and currently alive lives in the United States. 
Right. No other country has a greater percentage of its native born population living in the United States than, than El Salvador. So the relationship is always going to, by necessity, be an, be an important one. Um, but when it comes to things like development aid and um, funding for things like, the, like these projects, you know, I think the U.S. is going to have less ability to say we will only fund this particular road construction project if you improve something like, you know, good governance or transparency, because China is willing to say we'll fund that project for you and we won't ask difficult questions. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, I just want to add something small. I think China won't engage deeply with El Salvador, I mean, as soon as possible, China was just, will dismiss us. Like, like we, we don't represent anything important for them. I mean, uh, so I think it's true that China is going to, to finance many projects. There's a library going on, there's a stadium coming soon. But I, I think that at the end of this year, we're going to be like seeing huge amount of um, money coming in specific projects. So we have to be aware that um, really Bukele is trying to like diverse or to have this um, many neg negotiations with many countries. Uh, but it, it's, uh, let's see how, how, how it's, it turns out. But, but I mean, if he can manage that. Well, let's hope uh, El Salvador avoids some of that debt trap diplomacy that China has uh, become so skilled in around the world. Gabriel, let's stay with you. And uh, I want to ask you, in terms of your reporting or El, El Faro's reporting on President Bukele and negotiation with the gangs, this strikes me as extremely difficult type of journalism where you have two very powerful actors who most likely don't have any fear for uh, reprising against uh, you know, against investigative journalism. Can you talk a little bit about the dynamics and walk us a little bit behind the scenes on how, you know, how El Faro does this kind of reporting? Yeah, so um, we've been doing this kind of reporting since 2000, I don't know, 2011. I mean, El Faro has had this wonderful unit called Sala Negra who really, like investigated the gangs in, in El Salvador and in Central America and the connection with the US. Um, so for many years, we built the sources in among the, the gangs. And many people just like criticize us saying, why should El Faro give voice to a gang member that killed my brother or killed my sister or anything? And like, we said that we have to respond to society by giving voice to every part of the society. So um, we try to understand the phenomena, like just looking to each one of the, uh, the components of the, the phenomena. So um, I remember the first article of, of the politicians negotiation with gangs. It appeared in 2014. Uh, Norman Quijano, who was the presidency candidate for ARENA, the right-wing party, uh, had this close talks with, with gangs in order to gain um, like political retribution. I mean, he was interested in, in blocking the gangs promoting votes for FMLN. So we published that in 2014 with some of the negos, the, mod, the, I don't know how to call it, the negociadores, uh, the, 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 the people that um, we just interviewed this link between the gangs and the, and the parties. So they like confessed, they did this, this work for the parties, for the political parties, in order to obtain some um, some benefits in, in the polls. And since then, we've been like just 
receiving material from gangs and uh, and whistleblowers in, in, in within the government uh, that have access to documents or have access to uh, like uh, yeah videos of the moment when gangs and, and political and politics in um, I'm sorry the gangs and this uh, political members just like engage in conversations. We published the, the first videos of, of those kind of negotiations in 2016 and si since then um, we we also uh, could grab many many documents of prisons. Um, this piece of I mean, I shared an article, I shared a link just a minute ago in the chat. And um, that article explains how uh, this government, Bukele's government, just did what probably uh, Salvador Sanchez Ren, the president in 2014 did and, and what uh, Mauricio Funes did before. Uh, just uh, establishing a conversation with um, gang members, uh, and this time Bukele is very, he's being very precautious. He's very, very like careful and not, mm, not like uh, just doing the, doing this loudly, but certainly there are documents, official documents uh, that say that uh, the prison system is allowing to uh, gang members to enter the prisons. And um, uh, we don't know exactly what is the discussion they have, but there is absolutely, we have certainty that their, their negotiations is, um, I mean, the, Bukele is giving them uh, benefits in return of uh, if, if the gang members just load the, the rate homicide. So that's the kind of stuff we, <laughs> we manage here, yeah. Thank you, Gabriel. So we're almost out of time. I wanna do one last thing, which is I'm gonna ask each of you to provide us about 25 seconds responding to um, the words of Vice President Kamala Harris last week, where she declared that, uh, Washington must respond to attacks by El Salvador's leadership on the independence of its judiciary. She said, quote, an independent judiciary is critical to a healthy democracy and a strong economy. On this front, on every front, we must respond. What is the US response to all of this? And one of the points in the, in the Q&A from Mary Laporte is saying uh, that the Biden administration intends to bypass uh, the government because of corruption concerns and pass support onto nonprofits. Is that a viable area of support? Are there other kinds of responses the US should have? Um, Tiziano, why don't, I, why don't we start with you and offer us 25 seconds of your thoughts on what this country should do in response to some of the things happening in El Salvador. Thanks, Sandy. 25 seconds multiply, multiplied by... <laughs> um, I mean, I'll try to, to stick to the minimum. I think um, uh, the, the, the Biden administration is facing the puzzle of inheriting an increasingly resistant political elite in Central America God, that got accustomed, got used to a more transactional relationship with, with Washington. As was mentioned before, we give you something on foreign policy, on migration, and you don't meddle with uh, our internal affairs. Um, and, 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 but of course, there's a very different situation country by country in, in the region. Um, so I think what Washington should do is that to like uh, take on a more nuanced approach uh, towards this government. I don't believe that bypassing fully the government is a viable solution because of the government apparatus and reach and uh, ability to operate and possible backlash in terms of uh, closing, shutting down uh, diplomatic doors, etc. So that's, uh, I think, a, a diplomatic engagement, a strong and more constructive diplomatic engagement um, should be accompanied, should be 
first and foremost, and should be accompanied by clear demands, not broadly speaking, you know, demands on, on justice, rule of law, et cetera, but clear uh, red, red lines, basically, set on things that uh, um, would not be tolerated uh, moving ahead, and a clear consciousness on what the consequences for passing uh, crossing that, those red lines, which I don't think the Washington still here on. If they, I mean, the, the individual sanctions have not be so functional, for example, in Nicaragua as well, but also in Guatemala and elsewhere, uh, they, 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 of course, hurt the, the ego and some possibilities, but they don't really produce a political change. And what the El Salvador government needs is, is um, money, basically, to, to uh, deal with the, the debt crisis. So there are economic issues that the, the US government, an economic pressure that the US government could use. The problem with that is that it's a double-edged sword and could have uh, repercussions uh, if used on uh, the migration flows, uh, which is the, the priority for the US to avoid. So it will have to balance out this intention to, this is this uh, uh, eagerness to use the stronger tools or like threats at least, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the need to, 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 to reduce the number of arrivals at the US border. And I think it will be Tricky. Thank you. Thank you. That was a creative 25 seconds, but I respect that. <laughs> Tim, uh, over to you for your uh, 25 seconds. All right. Um, I don't think the Biden administration has a lot of tools given uh, Bukele's very strong uh, uh, pop popularity. But one thing I've been really concerned about is sort of all of these calls that say Washington has to do something and that's feel like they're calling for unilateral action. And so I think what I'd say is that the Biden administration needs to be in consultation with civil society in El Salvador for what civil society believes would be uh, most productive in this. And then the other thing is, you know, and this goes to going to non-governmental sort of sources, is supporting um, organizations like uh, the independent journalists at El Faro and Revista Factum and Gado and Cerrado, um, because if, if the free press gets um, uh, stifled in El Salvador, um, you know, they're all, you know, all bets are, are off. Uh, and so um, support, you know, ask civil society what it needs and support uh, independent journalism. Perfect. Well, well put. Gabriel, over to you. Yeah, I, I agree with him and Tiziano. Um, I think an intelligent approach of diplomats can be useful at this moment. Um, but I think also that U.S. can punish some <laughs> uh, state officers um, allegedly that are allegedly involved in uh, blocking democratic institutions. Um, we've seen members of Nuevas Ideas party uh, raging against the Tribunal Supremo, which is the, like, the, um, the electoral council here in, in the country. Or uh, I think those kind of behaviors have to be punished in some way, so I think uh, it will be positive to just withdraw the visas, for example, to some um, key staff members of, of Congress or or the government. And um, but also, I feel it's very important to the U.S. government to empower to like to link with the civil society here, um, not to to promote a coup or something, but. Uh, to really engage with society and, and tell society you have to take the uh, the control of your own country yep. and there's plenty of ways to, to do that so I think that's that's a solution thank you Gabriel last word goes to today's moderator Mary Jo what is the ideal U.S. response in this uh, in this situation Definitely communication with civil society, serious communication with civil society, 
over and over with the same groups and individuals. Uh, two things concern me, the uh, family reunification uh, 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 group that's trying to find the missing children. I'm really hoping that they engage more with NGOs, which have been successful in uh, joining children missing from the war and otherwise, and uh, not depend so much on the government. Um, and uh, I would suggest pressure on uh, the Salvadorans to successfully complete the judicial process for Mozote, because that will underline uh, uh, the fight against impunity. I don't, and also to be forthcoming about the US involvement in it to show how serious uh, we really are about this. Wonderful, well put. Let me thank all of you. Fascinating conversation. I feel like we need to do this again in six months to have an update on uh, on what will happen. Uh, fascinating stuff. Gabriel Labrador, thank you so much. Tiziano Breda, thank you. Tim Muth, and Tim was really the, the source of, uh, of all the speakers. And thank you, Tim, for, uh, for making this happen. Uh, really appreciated. Mary Jo McConaughey, happy birthday. And thank you again so much. Great pleasure, folks. Thank you so Bye. much for the invitation. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. See you soon. Right on. Thank you, everybody. Have yourself a fine day out there, and we will see you uh, next week on Wednesday for the Magnitsky Affair. Bye.